Okay, well, we're in here for a couple of uh, quick uh, sessions on uh, the uh, capstone class. So, uh, I hope you're enjoying these uh, uh, comments that I'm trying to help you with here. Uh, so, the first one I'm going to do is chapter 7. And chapter 7 on the uh, NALA preparation test is um, about the general law, about the background of the law. So one of the things we always want to keep in mind is that uh, there was an early English common law background to this. Uh, much of this country's legal system is founded on uh, the uh, people from England kind of reminds me of the early part of that uh, movie Cousin Vinny when he was talking about our little old ancestors from England, you know. Uh, and uh, so basically there were different uh, courts. The one court is called the Court of Common Pleas. Some states like Ohio and Pennsylvania still have Courts of Common Pleas. Uh, what this really means is General Jurisdiction Court. And general jurisdiction is they can hear everything, any case, they can hear any case. Now, a lot of times uh, they're really more into serious cases, uh, but keep in mind that they can hear anything. So, uh, for instance, other states like Indiana, they have circuit courts and superior courts. Uh, and, you know, so with some kind of a uh, reference, uh, New York, every trial court is a Supreme Court. So that's very confusing. Their highest courts are called appellate courts. So uh, that is one difference in the system. But generally speaking, then, we have general jurisdiction courts that uh, are based upon, uh, you know, the idea that they can handle any case from, you know, basically uh, shoplifting all the way up to murder or from the money part up from small claims all the way up to uh, multi-million dollar litigation. Now, one thing about it is, like I said, I want to make it clear that a lot of times they structure their situation in such a way that they don't have to deal with what they consider to be trivial kinds of cases. And I've had a lot of judges say, you know, well, I don't want to deal with a traffic case or whatever, I'm just too busy dealing with important stuff. So uh, that's how that works. Um, you need to understand that uh, the United States is kind of based on some philosophical, philosophical uh, ideas. And so some of these include natural law. And that's basically, you know, look at the trees, look at the wind. Uh, there's certain rules that apply. Uh, and this comes down even to uh, the legal system. There's also a concept in the law during uh, the 19th century called positivism. Positivism. And that generally speaking, uh, you know, that's that uh, people make their own choices, that there's an absolute, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, rhyme or reason to their decisions. Uh, the other thing is that there is uh, what we call uh, sociological jurisprudence. Wait a minute, now I've got to get this right. I knew I was missing this. Okay, and you know, basically that's where we're looking at tying in the social sciences into jurisprudence. I think that's a pretty practical approach. And then the last one that we got up on here is legal realism. So, you know, this is kind of the way it sounds. It's like a realistic approach to things. You know, it's what really happens. Uh, and that's one of the things. Some of these programs are so theoretical that they're just not really practical and it, they just don't really work. So uh, that's a goal then of it is that the system needs to be uh, realistic. Um, there are uh, different classifications. 
and so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Keep this in mind. Uh, there's a substantive. And there's procedural. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, what we're saying here is, you know, you know, what is a crime, for example? And procedural is how do we go about deciding whether something somebody committed a crime? So the substantive part of it is how is the, you know, what's the internal part, the substance of the uh, laws, and then this, this part, the procedural part, is more about methodology. How are we going to go about enforcing these different laws? Uh, also, we have what we call public and private law. So you want to look at the differences here. You know, this is like environmental protection, crimes, you know, things like that. Uh, when you get into the private law, it's a relationship between parties, contracts, situations like that. Also, uh, another approach, what we could call it, is civil versus criminal. Civil, you know, you could be talking about a divorce. And then while we're involved in this divorce, uh, which happens so many times, the man gets upset, beats up the woman because of something she said or whatever. So then it could go and actually be within one case, both a, a civil case and a criminal case at the same time. But it's really based on the relationship between these two people. Uh, big thing on civil cases between parties, man, woman, man, company. Uh, so they're basically private parties usually. Uh, there are some instances where it can be the government, but usually uh, between parties. Uh, this is exclusive over here. This is the state or federal, you know, versus one person or more, okay? So this is the state versus the person, whereas in the civil side, it can be any parties, okay? So it can involve private parties, it can involve the government, it can involve banks, uh, you know, BP, for example, uh, versus you for not paying your credit card bill. Whereas over here, if we had the BP oil spill, it'd be the federal government, the EPA versus BP. So, uh, you know, these are different things that, that we've got to look at as well. You know, what makes it a civil case? What makes it a criminal case? Uh, usually, if it's a criminal case, uh, we're, locking, we're talking about a loss of freedom. Where it gets a little confusing, there can be a fine. But in a civil case, we call that damages. So when we, it's in the language there. If you see, they're talking about civil damages, and that's a lot different than a crime. Uh, basically, organic sources of the law, generally speaking, if you hear somebody say that, it's the Constitution. Starts out the federal Constitution and then the state Constitution. So these are important places of what we call organic, which means the, the starting place. Organic, as we think about it, is like the earth. You know, the crops come out of the earth. So that's what they mean by organic. It's just starting, beginning. So we begin with the Constitution. Then we go on to uh, statutes. Okay, then some of the statutes get broken down to admin laws, like we were talking about uh, in another part, administration, and this is uh, rules and regs. Okay, and then uh, also out on this other uh, level, there are cases, of course, uh, so we don't want to forget that. And uh, so sometimes those are called common law. Other times people call it case law. So look both of these over. Statutes, you get into a lot of rules, regulations. There can be uniform laws, model acts, things like that. 
But some model acts do not have the force of law. It's just a suggested uh, set of laws that are put together by a committee of people from different states. Uh, it's only a law if it becomes a, a statute. Now, uh, constitutional law, uh, we have the different uh, limitation of state powers, and then it has what they call the enumeration of federal powers. Uh, Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. Uh, then this whole concept of judicial review is not really contained in the Constitution. It's something that developed uh, in the case law that followed. And then, of course, we have the Bill of Rights, which is the first ten amendments to the Constitution. And then later, after the Civil War, we have the 14th Amendment, which uh, really features uh, three, main, three main aspects, due process, equal protection, and then it really emphasizes the right to privacy, which is kind of a combination of the 14th and 9th and 10th Amendment. So uh, very important to consider uh, those aspects. Now, uh, what I want to hit on right now is what we call due process. It's very important. What is process? Okay, well, process is the process of having a case, you know, in court. So what is due process? Due process is the uh, fact that every person equal in this country have the same rights, so they have the same rights to the same process every time. So in other words, when we have a case in court, our case should be handled as you go through the whole system just the same as everybody else's. It shouldn't be different because we're wealthy. It shouldn't be different because we're poor. It shouldn't be different because we're black. It shouldn't be different because we're white. So when we get into due process, we're really talking about certain basic inalienable rights that are found in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, like, for example, the right to a trial, the right to subpoena witnesses, the right to cross-examine witnesses, the right to have an attorney, the right to remain silent, the right to have a neutral magistrate, and in some cases, the right to have a jury trial. So anything where you have potential of a fine or jail time, or in other words, a loss of your freedom, you're entitled to certain inalienable rights as a citizen in this country. And uh, the presumption, generally speaking, is someone gets arrested, they're a citizen until it's proven otherwise. So one of the problems we've gotten into with this Arizona, uh, some of these statutes they've been passing, as they've been passing laws uh, to have police inquire uh, just uh, you know, on top of the whole face of things, see somebody, uh, they look racially different, uh, and ask them if they're an American citizen. Well, you know, that's nobody's business until after you've got other charges against them. So in other words, you charge somebody with a felony, then you can make inquiry into some of these other things. Somebody's riding along in a car, minding their own business, you're not supposed to be able to snoop into their business. A lot of people don't like that. Uh, because they think it ought to be flipped on its head. But it's really funny to me, uh, and it's kind of something I learned out of the Bible, is uh, it just always depends on whose ox is being gored. And so what they mean by that is, I mean, you know, if, if it's your kid that's in trouble, then by golly, you want that kid to get every right that there is. But if it's some stranger's kid that's in trouble, well, you know, who cares? Well, just take him right out and shoot him, you know. Uh, and so that's a really a different... Uh, approached and a lot of that see should be the same in due process for both a stranger or your own children in other words you want all people treated like your own children okay so I want my son to be treated fairly with due process justice follow the whole system right down the line well I want somebody else's son to be treated that way too more so than I even care about how they treat me because you know I'll get by. I've proven that. Uh, but uh, sometimes when it's someone else, this whole thing of due process, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Well, important to keep in mind a couple things about the judicial system. We have what we call subject matter jurisdiction. 
and we have personal jurisdiction. These are two really important points, okay? The first one is, let's talk in simple terms first. Remember I was saying that they have certain courts that have unlimited subject matter jurisdiction. They can hear any case. Whereas if you go to city court, they can only hear certain cases. Shoplifting cases, traffic cases, simple battery cases. In other words, misdemeanors and infractions. Some city courts have a civil side, but it's very limited. You can only sue somebody for like $300. Uh, whereas municipal courts in Indianapolis, that limits like $10,000. So every court has a set subject matter jurisdiction. So if you bring a case in that court and they're not qualified to hear that because of subject matter, then you're in what we call the wrong court. So subject matter jurisdiction, can the court even hear that case? It's important. Now, the other one is called personal jurisdiction. Okay, so we check that one off. Personal jurisdiction is do you have jurisdiction over the person? Now, what do we mean by that? Does that person have sufficient contacts with that county? Okay? Has he ever even been in that state? Perfect case. There's this Padilla case. It's a different Padilla case. But it's a case where a guy had sex with a girl in St. Louis and they had a baby in St. Louis. Well then the girl moves back to Indiana to live with her parents and uh, she files a paternity case against the man who lives in Missouri. No evidence that he's ever stepped foot in Indiana. So that case eventually gets thrown out because the person has to have sufficient contacts with the state and the county in order for it to be proper. Now we sometimes confuse personal jurisdiction with another concept and that is called venue. Now one thing on this is there's a basic rule and then there's a, another rule. Okay basic rule is venue is proper in any county in Indiana. That's the basic rule. But then there's a thing called preferred venue. And what that means is the court is going to venue that case where there are some kind of contacts. So it kind of goes back to this up here. Okay, so it's one of those situations where when you're talking about venue, although it's true you can bring a case and they won't dismiss it because you've got it in the wrong county, uh, they will transfer it to the right county if they find that there is a preferred venue. Okay, and this day and age, judges are more than willing to transfer cases because they want to lighten their load. So, um, important concepts, subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and venue. And these all have an impact when you're trying to prepare a complaint or get ready to go to court because you want to be sure that you're in the right, uh, you know, court and you have to have the right answer to all three of these questions. You know, is it the amount of the lawsuit or the subject matter of the lawsuit right, correct for this court? Do we have jurisdiction over somebody? Do they even live in this state, for example? And do they live in this county, for example? So these are things uh, that are important. Basic rule of venue is the case ought to be filed where the defendant lives, not where the plaintiff lives. All too often now, and I saw this on television the other day, uh, we've got these collection attorneys filing all their lawsuits in their home county even though that violates the rules. It violates small claims rules because you're supposed to file that lawsuit in the defendant's county. How does that come up? Well, somebody ends up in one of the big hospitals in Indianapolis because they get transferred from a little hospital in, you know, Grant County or whatever. Well, then they end up, they run up some bills down in Indianapolis well, they've got to come back to Grant County to, you know, pursue those bills. Uh, they're not supposed to bring that lawsuit in Marion County, but they do it. They do it all the time, and it's incorrect. It's improper. And I think that, you, you know, well, the chickens are going to come home to roost on that uh, as sooner or later because 
I've seen it for years that they did that. They did it to me when my daughter was in the hospital down there. Uh, and that was even a lot longer story I could tell later. Suffice it to say that I didn't even know him any money, but um, they tried to claim that I did. And uh, they brought it in Marion County, which we had no connection with Marion County whatsoever. Uh, so, you know, these things come up. That's why I'm a, it's a little touchy subject for me. Uh, you need to bring these cases in the county where the defendant lives, not where the plaintiff lives. Okay, well, hey, basically that's going to be it for this. We're going to cover a few more points in a little bit. Hope you enjoyed this. Let me know if I can help you in any way. I'm always available at Rob Daywalt. at me.com, okay? So feel free to get a hold of me if you have questions. You can also just communicate with me through the Blackboard course in your communication tab under email. Okay, well, hey, enjoy. Get back with you a little bit later.